we have, of course, the best actor of our industry and ever, who I'm a huge fan of, and who better than her to read a passage from this wonderful short story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome none other than Shabana Azmi. Do you want to say something about it before I read? Would you like to? No, just a little bit. Get them up. So Salam Noni Apa is uh, about uh, two sisters. They are Ismaili sisters. One is 68, one is uh, two, three years younger. And uh, the thing about sisters is that no matter how old you get, that banter between sisters and teasing each other doesn't seem to go. So you, when you're with your sister, you behave like you're 12 and 14, no matter how old you get. And uh, this is a story, and the part that Shabana Ji is about to read is uh, about when the daughter comes back from uh, London and she uh, meets her mother and her aunt, and this is the conversation that they have. In the first week of January, Malika came to visit Noni Appa from London. She got her mother and aunt a suitcase filled with imported goodies, chocolates, perfume, hair dye, and of course, the one thing that every Indian woman pesters her NRI relatives for, undergarments from Marks and Spencer. <laughs> Bini eagerly took the coveted items from Malika and dramatically declared, these British are really third-rate people. I tell you, their only saving grace lies in their first-rate bras. Their balcony-style marks and sparks give such good support and pushes everything properly in place, straight from basement level to perfect third floor height. <laughs> that Friday, Bini dragged Malika to the Jamaat Khana, hoping some nice Ismaili boy would prostrate himself at her feet. In the car, Bini was chuckling away. Malla, you know when your father passed away, Appa was not that old, just close to 50. She would go to the Jamaat Khana in her tightly draped sari and her pink lipstick. Noni Appa interrupted. Again this story, Bini, how many times? Bini laughed and ignoring her sister's protests continued. Really, let me say what I want. Huh. So all the men in the Jamaat Khana would look at her and keep trying to say, Ya Ali, Madad. And then when they would go completely out of control, they would find sources to Malika giggled. What does out of control mean, Bini Masi? What would they do? Explode in their pants? And Noni Appa, horrified, almost banged into the auto rickshaw that had suddenly halted in front of her. She? Not dirty like that. They would send proposal, that's all. And after that, your mother, always such a prude with her constant, no, Bini, I don't want to get a bad reputation, would never even greet them back, said a giggling Bini. But I think things have changed. If you really want to know what out of control is, Malla, then you have to look at your mother. These days, she's panting all over that yoga teacher, her boyfriend, Ananji. And imitating her sister with a wobbly falsetto voice, Bini continued, Ananji, have a whiskey today. The weather is perfect for it. Turning that poor vegetarian Gujubhai to an alcoholic, that also on my whiskey. Malika exclaimed, Mom, you didn't tell me all this. Noni Appa, wanting to strangle her sister, said, Yali, it's nothing like that. Yes, I offered him a drink, and so sometimes he has one now when we play. Your Masi hates cards, so what should I do? Just keep playing by myself? But the good nature dribbing in the car didn't stop. And since Noni Appa could not turn her hearing aid off while driving, she just had to bear with her family, her eyebrows raised in exasperation, shaking her head at their sly digs. Wonderful, thank you. As I was saying, the legend of Lakshmi Prasad talks about the triumph of a girl. And I truly believe this young child has triumphed from where she was and where she is today. I'm proud of her because she is my baby legend. I love you, Alia Bhatt. Please come on stage. <laughs> Poor Ranveer and Alia. They have to read after Shabana Azmi. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> that, there should be a disclaimer. Yes, there should be a disclaimer that I'm terribly nervous. I don't think I've... I was so nervous before giving my first shot for my first film. Karan. Yeah. No, I know. I, I, I feel you. Fast. Doop, 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 doop. Uh, mm. But <clears throat> I just want to say um, thank you for having me here. It's a very intelligent room. <laughs> <laughs> and a very um, wise room. I'm going to try and read very well. 
<clears throat> Bijendra Prasad was very fond of his little daughter. He always told her that she reminded him of her grandmother. They had the same narrow hands and long face, the gap between the tip of the nose and the lips disproportionately large, but pleasing all the same. On balmy afternoons, he would sit with her after lunch and tell her stories from the Ramayana. One day, he told her about Shravan Kumar, who looked after his blind parents, spending his whole life serving them. Engrossed in the story, he murmured, that is why a son is so important for his old parents to lean on. With daughters, all our savings go away in giving and giving. Lakshmi, now 16, understood that he was talking about Sukriti, the intermittent demands by her in-laws and the last year for more dowry or gifts as they called it. But she didn't ask him about it. Just at the mention of her sister's name, her father's mouth would tighten and he would rub his bony collarbone wearily and say, Sukriti is all right. Everything is all right. It is manageable. Till the day it wasn't. And a sunken-eyed Sukriti, her skin stretched like paper over each protruding rib, returned home holding the gifts her in-laws had given her in return, burns on her back from boiling water and hot pans. Sukriti was back, and as they also discovered a few months later, looking at her growing stomach, she had not come back alone. They sent news of her pregnancy to her husband in Tulsipur, but no one came to take her back. Well done, Alia. Thank you very much. Ranbir Kapoor to read an excerpt from The Sanitary Man. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Twinkle, uh, congratulations on your juggernaut of a book plug-in. Uh, <laughs> juggernaut of a book. Uh, when, uh, when I was asked to read a passage uh, from the book, I was really excited and I messaged Twinkle saying that I'll bring my bestest English. And uh, Pat came a reply saying that, don't worry, his English is as bad as yours. So just come and read. Uh, so I'm asked to read a passage from uh, The Sanitary Man and a Sacred Land. But before that, I just want to read something which is on the third page of the book, which goes like, for Akshay, each time there is a power cut, you, my friend, always have a flashlight handy. Uh. Prashant Batra submitted his story to the Guardian titled, The First Man to Wear a Sanitary Napkin. It was a four-page article chronicling Bablu Kevat's journey from Mohana to Indore. And with that, troops of ruddy-faced journalists wielding straw hats and bottled water, along with the dictaphones, began descending on Bablu Kevat's workshop from all over the world. The Times of India was the first Indian newspaper to feature Bablu Kevat and his unique invention. A half-page story on page six sandwiched between an advertisement of Syntex water storage tanks and an announcement that wished Sardar Ranga Singh a very jolly birthday, Sarji. Bablu Kevat had started getting famous. There were television interviews where poker-faced anchors not quite focusing on the work he was doing with non-profit and women's group kept trying to draw out salacious details of him wearing a pad and leaking blood all over himself. He was invited to speak at universities and companies and conferences across the country. Bablu found himself enjoying these talks. There was one rather memorable experience in Bhopal. It was a packed hall with a panel of dignitaries from around the world and attended by the Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Employment. Bablu began his talk by pulling out a sanitary napkin from his pocket and waving it in front of the startled guest, asking how many men have touched a sanitary pad in their life. When no one responded, he walked up to the minister and said, well, sir, here is your chance. Come, hold this. I promise it won't bite. The startled minister looked helplessly around, waiting for someone to rescue him, and with no escape in sight, gingerly took the sanitary pad in his hand. Bablu continued, you're feeling, you're feeling embarrassed holding that pad, aren't you, sir? This shame in discussing menstruation in holding a sanitary pad is one of the biggest hurdles we face. It is as if menstruation is not a natural function, but a sin that women unwillingly commit through the uterus and have to hide away from prying eyes, lest they be declared guilty of the crime of bleeding. 
this shame is the reason why women take their stained pieces of cloth, wash them secretively, and hang them to, to dry in places where even the rays of sun cannot spot them. Then they end up using those moldy, bacteria-laden pieces of fabric and get diseases. Let us all refuse to be part of this game of shame because it is nothing but a losing game for all humanity. The audience was spellbound and couldn't stop clapping. Taking his sanitary pad back from the hapless minister's hands, Bablu added with a twinkle in his eye. And I would like to end my speech by thanking women and the menstrual cycles. Without them, this talk, along with our very existence, would not be possible. Later, laughing about the event, he confessed to Sarita. Sarita ji, I told them only 10% of women in India used a sanitary pad. Actually, I fudged the number. It is only 5%. I just added 5% more on stage because I did not want to embarrass Bharat Mata so much in front of all the foreigners. Thank you. Thank you. Now that is what you call a powerful vagina monologue. It truly is, in every which way. Thank you, Ranbir. Thank you for rendering it so well.